let's get this into perspective. We're going to finish up the prologue of John today. And if we're going to finish up the prologue of John, I, I want you to get a little bit more of the flavor of the book in your mind. So the Apostle John is a young cousin to Jesus. You've got to put together several New Testament verses to realize that. John the Baptist is a cousin of Jesus. It, the scripture directly says it. But you can put together some other verses and make it sit clear that John the Apostle was also a younger cousin of Jesus. But he was a young cousin. In fact, if you see old medieval paintings of, of the Apostles, in the medieval paintings, the painting of John almost looks, uh, what's a good way of saying? Some people mistake him for a, a, a girl in some of the paintings. He looks not effeminate, but, but does not look like a, a guy, okay? And the reason why is because the painters understood he was so young that he may have been prepubescent. I don't think he was that young based upon some things I read in Scripture, but he clearly was very young. And so you've got this fella who is part of Jesus. He gets to hang around with the older cousin. He gets called. He gets to be a part of the team. He's got the intimate relationship, and he works through. And John may have just been in his young 20s at the time Jesus at the age of 33 is, is um, crucified. John and the other pillars of the church, they teach the faith. They're loyal and faithful to God and the service God called them to. And they think initially that, that Jesus is coming back any day now. They know they're in the last days and they think the last days are about to just end. And so they're expecting Jesus to come back and, and over time, they begin to realize that he's not coming back on any of our timetables. He's coming back on his own. And there had been thousands of years from the time he was promised till the time he came. And there's no telling how long it might be until he comes again. But it won't be until the fullness of time. And as they begin to realize this, they began to, to write about the life of Jesus so that we would have firsthand accounts of the life of Jesus. And the synoptic gospels get written. And we have Matthew and Mark and we have Luke. Matthew was an apostle. Mark was the buddy who hung on to Peter and wrote Peter's gospel. Luke is the one who hung around with Paul and was also the medical doctor with good research techniques. He could take a history. Is Sherry in here today? Sherry, you sounded great singing today. I don't know if she's in here or not. She usually sits over there. But, but you know, a doctor takes a good history. And, and, and Luke does that, and, and so he writes his account. It's decades later. When John decides as he's getting into old age and he's in his 70s and he's in his 80s and he decides he needs to write his gospel and he's urged to do that by others. And so John begins to write his gospel and John's gospel is different than the other gospels. He's telling stuff that the others didn't tell. Is he's the last one of the apostles who's the last eyewitness to so many of these events that enable him to tell things that, that the other gospel writers didn't have time or space to put in. So when we read his gospel, we read something different. His gospel is also different because it starts with kind of a prologue and an introduction, if you will. And that prologue is the highway that we've been traveling so far. And so we've gone through this class, and Pastor David taught for us that first stop of the Word and God, and how the Word was God. And then he continued on to explain how the Word was there in creation, and was a part of creation, and nothing was made without the Word. And then we looked at John the Baptist, and how he fit into the Word, and what he was there to do with the Word. And then last week we took class, and we talked about how the Word was incarnate, and dwelt among us tabernacled among us. 
And so we had that last week. This week is the final stop in the prologue. This week we're going to talk about the greatness of the word. It's the crescendo. It's the big build. So John has started out this prologue talking about uh, uh, in the beginning, the Word's already there. And he talked about how everything that's been made has been made through the Word. And John the Baptist has been called to do the Word. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of God. All of this has been done, and he sums up with this final stop on the greatness of the Lord, and he says the following, John bore witness about Jesus. John cried out, This, this, was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. And then John, John, the writer continues. He's no longer quoting the Baptist here. For from the fullness of Jesus, from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who's at the Father's side. He has made him known. And that's the end. If you get nothing else out of that passage, what you need to understand is what John was telling him, is that Jesus outshines everyone else. To jump from the sermon that I gave today. Jesus is the Holy One of Israel. Jesus is the Holy One who is set apart and unique and distinct and higher than all others. The Paul passage that I started quoting that Jesus, although he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself and took the form of a human. That passage ends with God highly exalted him and bestowed on Jesus the name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Every tongue proclaim that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, that's the message. You ready to dig into it? Let's dig into it. We've got some fun things today. All right, it starts out. John bore witness about Jesus. Now, just look at that for a minute. John bore witness about him. All right, I've got to give you a geek, Greek alert. Okay, that should say Greek alert. Excuse me. All right, in fairness, it's both. All right, so um, uh, a little uh, Greek geek alert here. Okay, we're going to look at the Greek for a minute. If you look at the Greek for a minute, I've put it up here in the English Standard Version and in the NIV. If you get the email of the lesson, I threw in the 1611 King James just for fun. John bore witness about Jesus. That's the English Standard Version. The NIV says John testified concerning Jesus. And that's the NIV. If you'll notice both of those, how many of you remember English grammar at all? Okay, clearly 20%. That's a good... The other 80% of you, I'm about to teach you something. It's called verb tense. Look at this. These are past tense. John bore witness. This is what he did. This is past tense. Right? But here's the catch. The Greek is present tense. If you're reading it in the Greek, it says John bears witness about Jesus. Doesn't say past tense, he did. It says present tense, he does. 
martyrio is the Greek word, the verb, uh, although in that sense it's martyria, E-I ending, because it's he, present tense. He bears witness. Now, I hope you're like me. I hope you're saying, huh, what's going on here? Are the translators daft? Did they forget second week Greek class? Did they fail to get, look, I missed a question on a Greek exam, second week of Greek class. Because I took a present tense and I translated because I was in a bit of a hurry and I put it into the past tense. I got it counted wrong. By the way, um, our Greek professor, some of you got to know him a little bit. Uh, he passed away recently and uh, his name was Harvey Floyd. He was, uh, I was talking to another one of our Greek students and at the end of this year, Dr. Floyd would pass out a, basically a test, a paradigm sheet. And there's like 249 different forms of all of these verbs and stuff. And he would make you just from memory write out all of the conjugations of all 249 forms with every accent and every everything. And my friend missed um, one out of the 249, and as Dr. Floyd was handing back the papers, he called my friend by name, and he looked at it, and he said to my friend, you can do better than this. <laughs> <laughs> and he made my friend rewrite the whole exam, all 100, 249, paradigm. So, so you're sitting there saying, are the translators daft? Did they miss this? No, they're not daft. Of course they're not daft. So what's going on here? Well, John bore witness in the sense that it happened 60 years before John wrote the gospel. So 60 years before the gospel. I mean, John the Baptist has been dead for almost 60 years at this point in time. So it's clearly something he did in the past, and they're translating the Bible so that we English people can read that Bible in English and understand what's being said. That is what's being said. John bore witness to him. By the way, I am a baby whisperer, if you want to bring that kid to me. <laughs> we are fresh off a week with the granddaughter. I'm feeling pretty cocky. <laughs> she wants me. Um... And if it doesn't work, I hand her to Becky, and that's perfect. Um, but I got it down for about three minutes. Um, they, they know that that's the way to translate it for us. Okay? But John didn't write it that way. John knew the people would understand that he's talking past tense, but John writes in present tense. And I think he does so for two reasons. Um, I think, uh, uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Why present tense? There. I was really proud of that one. Um, okay, get it back out of the way. One, it was still something John heard in his ears. John, the writer, the gospel writer, could still hear the Baptist proclaiming who Jesus was. So it's something John did, but that bearing witness was something that was still alive, still real, still ringing in the ears of John the writer. Does that make sense? And, and I pause there because this is important. Way too often, we run a real risk as we are so involved in the world in which we live where we eat substantive food that we touch, where we interact with people that we know, where we drive a car, where we live in a, an apartment or a house or a trailer or, or under a bridge. We're living among real things that we're experiencing. And there's always a danger of saying, geez, 
That happened 2,000 years ago. Did it really happen? I don't know. I mean, I'm pretty comfortable in church. I'm going to keep going. I'm not going to worry about it if I miss some, though. You know, I mean, and I, I've got the card punch just in case it's all real. But, uh, these are verses that are in there in a way that the reader should know this is a real person writing who says, this is something I heard. This is still a voice in my head. John is still bearing witness to who Jesus is. I'm writing something to you that's real. I experienced it. I know it. Some of you in this place are, did not live when Ronald Reagan was president. I did. And I can hear his voice in my head. And I can tell you stories about Ronald Reagan being president. I can tell you stories about the FBI coming to our house in Lubbock. Because I took economic history of the United States with John Hinckley, who shot President Reagan. We don't talk about that at Texas Tech much. And, and, and the FBI wanted to know what he was like in college and did I know him because I was in class with him. And I mean, I didn't, I, I, what, we're going to vote him most likely to assassinate a president or something. I mean, we, I didn't know the guy. This is college. But, but, but I can tell you things that happened and they're still in my head. This is not a made-up story. This is not some made-up gospel this is an eyewitness who is using some of his last days to put into writing things so that people would know what he experienced and what really happened on this planet. I think there's a second reason, though. By the time John writes, this becomes a very special word. Martyrau becomes, let's see if we can go to the Elmo here. Uh, 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 not Elmo, the Ipivo. Excuse me, Ipivo. People who graciously gave us this so that we would promote it. All right. Let's go to the uh, Ipivo. So the, the Greek word for this is martyreo. That's the verb. John bore witness. Now look at that word. Let me write that word in English for you. I'll use a green marker in English letters instead of Greek. They're not hard to get. It's M A. That P is actually an R T. When you have the upsilon, the U between two consonants, and you put it into English, you turn it into a Y. Okay? And then that EO at the end is just the ending that tells you what part of the verb is being used. So that's the root. Martyr. A martyr is someone who was bearing witness to the point that they gave their life. John the Baptist was beheaded because of his refusal to leave alone the mission that God put in his life to bear witness to Jesus. And by the time that John writes his gospel, martyreu has become a word that is also meaning not just a witness, but a, a martyr, a witness with your life. And the church had already experienced many martyrs by this point in time. People who said, I saw this with my eyes. I know this to be real. I will die before I will deny the Lord. Tertullian, 200 years later, or 100 years after this, says the seed of the church is the blood of the martyrs. It cannot leave you unaffected when someone says, I so believe this. I'm so convinced. Take my life. I'm fine with that. You will die painfully. Okay. Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. 
that, that overwhelming recognition and confidence in who God is and what God did in Jesus is the reason that Christianity conquered the Roman Empire. And once you're a martyr, you are always a martyr. John wasn't just a martyr then. He is a martyr even today. He is a martyr as a witness for eternity. And I think that there is some niceness in using the present tense for the kind of testimony that he gave because he gave it as a martyr. So when you read the, the English, John bore witness about him. You're right to understand that's what he did in the past. But we're missing something if we don't understand that John in the Greek is saying, and I know that, I heard that. It's still echoing in my ears, in my brain. I can still, the gray cells still have that memory recognition of it. And what's more is he did it to the point of martyrdom for eternity. So understanding that, let's go to the next part of this. For from his fullness, the fullness of Jesus, we have all received grace upon grace. The Greek actually reads grace in the place of grace. Like when one grace is up, another grace comes in. Grace upon grace. Lavish grace. All right? Now, let's talk history for just a moment. So I want to take you back historically to Ephesus. If you ever have an excuse to go over to Turkey and you don't go to Ephesus, you are missing something. The ruins at Ephesus are amazing. So let's go to the ruins of Ephesus, but let's understand Ephesus is where church history teaches us John was when he wrote this gospel. If we put this up here on a map, an overhead satellite view of the Middle East. Uh, that's Jerusalem down there. Ephesus is right over here on the coast of Turkey. It's a coastal town. By the way, there, it's now silted up because the river that goes there just snaked back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And when it does that, it brings all the silt and it just builds it up in the harbor. And so it's no longer a coastal town. That river, by the way, the name of it is the Meander River. We get the word meander from it because that's what meander is. So the distance between Ephesus and Jerusalem is about 1,125 miles. For us, be thinking it's the distance from Houston to Palm Beach, Florida. So it would have taken him about 25 hours to drive it if he had a car <laughs> and a good highway. And he didn't stop too, for too many bathroom breaks. If he was with me, we could have driven it, I think, in about 21 hours. But walking, it's a whole different subject. How many of you are saying, yeah, I think I'm going to walk to Palm Beach, Florida, go see my kids. You better leave early. <laughs> That's where John is gone. We don't know precisely when, but there are some good indications in Scripture that he was probably there by the mid-60s at least maybe even a little bit earlier. So, you've got Ephesus. Now, church history teaches he was there, but who started the church in Ephesus? Paul. So Paul starts the church. John goes there later to minister. Think about this for a moment. Here is what Irenaeus, Irenaeus wrote 175. He didn't know John, but he knew John's student, protege. Then again, the church in Ephesus founded by Paul and having John remaining among them permanently until the times of the emperor, Roman emperor Trajan, is a true witness of the tradition of the apostles. And this is a book Irenaeus is writing against heresy. And he's saying, hey, heretics, you know, realize John taught the true gospel and here it is and uses it against the heresies. He also says in the same area, just actually right before it, afterwards John, 
the disciple of the Lord who leaned upon his breast, referencing the Last Supper, did himself publish a gospel during his residence at Ephesus in Asia. So we're reading a gospel that pretty good church, and it's not just Irenaeus, other early church fathers as well, wrote and recognized in the early church was unanimous. This is a gospel written from Ephesus. Now, John and those in his churches in the Ephesus area for several decades had had Paul's letter to Ephesus. Paul wrote Ephesians. Paul wrote a letter to the church. The New Testament's not been put together yet, but Paul's letters pretty early on are accumulated. But even if Paul's letters are not accumulated yet, we know that Ephesus had the Ephesian letter. And they had it for decades. And you've got to know that it influenced not only their practice, but it influenced their doctrine. It influenced their vocabulary. They would have read it. They would have studied it. They would have used it. They held it up as something from the apostle of God that had started their church. It is is from the founder. It is a document that is to be passed around. So it is not surprising, and we'll see this as we work through the Gospel of John dozens of times, that John uses language and ideas that are heavily uh, uh, expressed in Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. And so it helps us understand some of this. So when we look at this passage that we're focusing on right now, from his fullness, the fullness of Jesus, we have all received grace upon grace. We should read it understanding how Paul used these terms among the Ephesians And understanding how Paul used these concepts among the Ephesians, that first audience of John and his gospel. Because this is the language. It's no different today. We have language that's ours. We can talk about some things at church that people outside of our churches may not understand. And I can talk to you about, uh, um, you know, Brent's hasta la pasta. Y'all will get that. Nobody else will. But if I make a joke about, hey, Brent, you know, you think Italian food is hasta la pasta, blah, 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 blah. Y'all get that because of what he said in announcements. If we make a joke about donuts, y'all get that. We have donuts. Uh, Here comes hasta la pasta man. Um, (laughs) That was not your cue to come up here and talk about lunch, Brent. If we talk about donuts... You know, Pastor David last week talked about donuts in the sermon because Baptists are big on donuts. Well, I got some, I've got Dr. Bob and Kelly here who grew up in the Catholic Church forever and a day, and I suspect at the Catholic Church at Mass, you don't get donuts. You get pizza? That's only at the Italian Catholic churches. Um, His last name is Leone. Um, So, so... So, so, you know, there, there are jokes, there's language, there's thoughts. And so when we read this and we read the fullness, we've received grace upon grace, we need to read it in light of some of the passages. So I'm going to throw some Ephesians up here. I want you to look at some of this Ephesians with me. I want you to look at Ephesians 1, just the letter and how the letter starts out. Whoa. All right. Um, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. The idea that we, from the fullness of Christ, receive grace upon grace makes a lot of sense. That He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Look at, look at verse 7. In Him... We have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches 
the fullness, the, 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 the thoroughness of his grace. From the fullness of him, we've received grace upon grace. When you talk to a church that's memorized the passage, that the forgiveness of our trespasses comes according to the riches, the lavishness of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. I, you, you, if you were weaned on those verses, then you've got a better understanding of what John is talking about when he wrote, and he said, from the fullness of Jesus, we've all received grace upon grace. That's an incredible thing. If you look at it, uh, uh, 22 and 23, two other ones that jumped out from chapter 1 of Ephesians. Go back to Ephesians for a moment. On the, Elma, uh, on the yeah, thank you. So 22 through 23. That God put all things under Jesus' feet. That God gave Jesus as head over all things, which is his, over the church, which is his body. The fullness of him who fills all all in all. From his fullness we have received. We are the church. We are his fullness. And we've been received from him because he's filled all in all. And John said, what's he filled us with? First and foremost, his grace. Out of his fullness, you see the echo there? You see how that's going to have special meaning to these folks? You look at it, and, he, and John continues. I mean, uh, Paul continues. He's talking about him. He says uh, uh, he's, we're going to be seated with him in the heavenly places. I'm in chapter 2 now. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace. Grace upon grace. In kindness toward us in Christ. By grace you've been saved. And this is, this is the language that John's giving us. This is what we're to understand. The greatness of the Word. If we go back to the PowerPoint, the greatness of the Word is based on who the Word is. The, the greatness of the Word is not simply... Um, hey, that's it's, it's a good thing. That's a big thing. No, he's God and out of his fullness. So out of the fullness of God, he's provided to his church grace upon grace. Please understand grace as a concept is not just an adjective. It's not simply a reference to being gracious. Mark Wilkie. You're a gracious person. You are. Very gracious fella. If you don't know Mark, come get to know him and ask him if you can come over to his house for dinner. <laughs> and Mark is so gracious, he will say yes. I, I, I've got gracious people all around me. I won't embarrass all of you by calling out your names. I know Mark doesn't mind. But graciousness is not the word that's being used. A noun is being used. The word grace has at its root the idea of a gift. The grace of God by which we're saved, which he pours out upon us, is that which God did for us at Calvary. It is the sacrifice of Jesus. And this is the grace upon grace upon grace. And we need grace upon grace. I need the grace of God right now to forgive me of all of my shortcomings. But I'm going to need the grace of God tomorrow. Because I've got a whole bunch more I'll need to be forgiven of by this time tomorrow. Starting with gluttony from lunch if I'm not careful. <laughs> But the greatness of the Word is based on who the Word is. And the Word is God. So we're getting this from God Himself. And the nice part about it is, 
the greatness of God is not simply His power and might. If you're thinking about, yes, God is great. Look at His power and might. I, I spoke from Isaiah 6 this morning. The awesome power of the great Holy One of Israel. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Yes, yes, yes. God is awesome in His power. But what makes Him great isn't simply His power and might. Look, there are despots in this world who are very powerful and mighty, but they're not great. There are rulers in this world who are very great and mighty. I mean, very powerful and mighty, but they're not great. The greatness of God isn't simply His power and might. It is His love. And what John gives us is John unfolds the love of Jesus. John is a love story. So here you've got this young cousin of Jesus whom Jesus entrusted Aunt Mary to on the cross. Son, behold your mother. Take care of her. By the way, church history says Mary went to Ephesus as well. And you can find the tomb of Mary still there. Um, John took care of her. He, did, he discharged his responsibility till she died. But, but here you've got this young fellow. And, and he, he could ride on the might of God... He could write on the might of Jesus. He could write on grand theological concepts. He could explain how Jesus overcame the demons. He could explain everything in the world of, from the might and power of God. But what John did is he explained the wise, the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus so loved the world he came. Greater love, Jesus, this is in John. John's the one who said, greater love has no one than to give their life for a friend. John's the one who has Jesus say, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. John's the one who has Jesus say, I've come so that you could understand that the Father loves me and I love you because the Father loves you. John's the one who explains the greatness of God isn't simply that he can speak everything into being. And everything that's created is created because God is there. The greatness of God is that he does all of that because he loves us. He cares about us. We're real to him. And he should be real to us. And that's the grace, that's the forgiveness that comes through Jesus. And that's the plain and simple truth of the whole message. And it's the reason that he's able to say that Jesus is greater than anyone else because Jesus is the expression of God's love. Isaiah already had the vision of God's might and grandeur and, and, and righteousness. But it's the expression of God's love that changes the entire game and spectrum for our lives. So John finishes this section of the prologue, noting, from the fullness we've all received, grace upon grace, the law was given through Moses. Uh, that, that's... that's um, the law was given. The verb there uh, uh, from ditto me is, is a passive form of the, the verb. In other words, Moses didn't write the law. Moses didn't come up with the law. Moses didn't give the law. The law was given through Moses. He's the vessel. He's the tool. I mean, I don't want to call him a tool, but you get the idea. I didn't mean that in a derogatory way. He's, he's like the greatest Old Testament figure we've got. But Moses, the law is given through Moses. That's a big deal. The law is an expression of God's holiness. 
It's an expression of God's care for his people. The law is a massive deal, but the law is the law. The Torah. In comparison, look what we have from Jesus. We have grace. The forgiveness that comes from a true atonement for our sins. I don't need Yom Kippur today to take care of what I've done this last year. I don't need an altar to kill a goat. The blood of Jesus has satisfied the holy righteousness of God for all time, for all sin. I just need that. That grace, the truth of that, comes through Jesus Christ. That's a middle verb that's used. Agenito. It's the same word, if you remember, when I talked about agenito before, how it's, it was born, it was created, it came to be. Agenito, it's used uh, uh, multiple times, but we had that whole class on, there was a man, John the Baptist, agenito, he was born. This grace and truth came through, it was born, it was conceived, it came into being through Jesus Christ. The true justification for the world came through Jesus Christ on the cross. And there's a stark difference between that and Moses. Moses in Exodus 33 wanted to see the glory of God. That was his request. God, show me your glory. God says, no man can see my glory and live. Not going to happen. But there's a cleft in the rock. I'm going to put you in the cleft in the rock. I'm going to pass by in my glory with my hand covering the rock. And then you can sort of catch my backside as I walk by. But you can't behold my face and live. Humans can't do it. Now, I, a number of people came up to me after class and said to me, do you think that was really God's physical presence going past Moses? And I said, no. I want to tell those of you who asked me that, that you're in good stead asking that question. Jewish rabbis and scholars and sages asked that question for ages. And a number of them in the Talmuds would rewrite that passage and kind of take part of that out because they didn't like the way it put a human form on God. But that's the text. God has no trouble using human language to refer to who he is. Though he's clear, he's a spirit, he's not a supersized human. But we'll talk about uh, 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 God in all sorts of ways. He talks about the universe being held in the palm of his hand. Talks about his fingers making the sky. You know, that God was, was not just handy dandy craftsman. Those are called anthro man, promorphisms. Morph means to, 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 to form. So this is taking the form of a human and using those types of words for God. We do the same thing with animals sometimes. We do the same things with, with, uh, um, Star Trek, the Starship Enterprise, Kirk to Scotty. Scotty, give me more warp. Scotty, she's given her all she's got, Captain. <laughs> okay, well, she ain't given nothing. Uh, but he's anthropomorphized the USS Enterprise. Yes, I am a nerd. NC, NCC 1701, I think, was the insignia number. So anyway... So, so, so this is an anthropomorphism of God. But the point is, who God really is, the only God, has actually been seen by Jesus Christ, who is also God. And how we, what we need to see from God and what we need to know of God, we see when we see Jesus. And when we see Jesus, we see a God who cares about holiness because he's willing to die for sin. We see a God who cares in compassion because he'll stop and talk to the woman who's gone through six or seven husbands that everyone else ignores, that only goes to the water well 
in the heat of the day when no one else is there. Jesus will talk to, 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 to the, the tax collectors. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. And he climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And when the Lord came passing by, he looked up in that tree, and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down from there, because I'm going to your house today. We sang that four years old. Yeah, they're still singing it down in the front row. <laughs> Jesus sees 5,000 people. He's got a couple of loaves and five fish. He's, he didn't say, hey, y'all go get something to eat, man. We got enough for a couple of us here. He feeds everybody. He cares for people. He weeps when Mary and Martha's brother dies and he sees how much it hurts him. He helps his mom help out a member important to the family when the wedding wine runs out before a time and the humiliation factor is about to set in. This is who he is. This is God though. Now, God will throw out the money changers. God doesn't cotton hypocrisy. God's got no trouble calling down the Pharisees. But if we're going to have the heart of Jesus, boy, we got to be there. If we want to have the heart of God, boy, we got to be there. Sometimes I get scared to death of the Pharisaism that creeps in to our congregation. And look, I'm not throwing rocks at anybody. I'm throwing them at myself. It is just all too easy for us to expect everybody else to be perfect. At least in ways that we deem important. And we've got to understand the mercy and the grace of God extends to everybody and every sin in every way. And I'm no better off than any of the rest of you, and you're no better off than I am. Pastor David's no better off than any of the rest of us, and we're no better off than he is. Pastor Brent is no better off than the rest of us, and we're no better off than he is. That's just the way it is. And so when we see Jesus, we see the love of God. Jesus, he outshines everyone, even Moses. That's the prologue. That's just the taster. John's going to unfold this in his gospel. I'm excited to share it with you. Here's your take home. Number one, I'm going to praise Jesus, the Word of God. Grace and truth came through Jesus. Jesus died for my sins. Jesus shows me the Father. Jesus is worthy of my praise. I'm going to praise him in all the ways I talked about this morning. I'm going to sing praise to him. I'm going to gather with my family and worship together corporately. I'm going to do it in humility, I hope. Understanding my need for his forgiveness and my own inadequacies. I'm going to do it by keeping his commandments and loving other people. I'm going to do it by saying, put me in, coach, where can I play? You tell me where to go and I'll go. You want me to keep this bench from rising up? I'll sit on the bench. You want me to go out there and shoot three-pointers? I'll go out there and shoot three-pointers. You put me in. You tell me what to do. Praise God. Next, I'm going to walk in the grace of God. I'm going to walk in the forgiveness. From His fullness, we've received grace upon grace. I want to tell you something. Look back in your life. Nobody's in your brain but you. Look back in the deep, dark shadows. The stuff you don't want anybody to see. The stuff you don't want anybody to know. The stuff that you pray God keeps quiet till you die. Now, the reason I want you to think about that is because if you lay that down at the feet of Jesus and say, God, 
I confess this sin, I repent. I'm so sorry, please forgive me. You have forgiveness. The distance between you and those historical events in who you are is the distance between east and west. And if at that point you continue to be shamed by that, that's Satan messing with your mind. Because if you've been forgiven, there's no more shame. The true moral guilt is gone. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old has passed away. And all things are made new. And you don't need to... Uh, no. Now, don't get me wrong. You can look at those things and say, thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. But, but the forgiveness of God that comes from that needs to be a trophy on your shelf, not a shame that weighs around your neck. And that's the message we need to teach others. People need to see us as a loving, kind, forgiving people. Or we're not following the Lord. I mean, God may have sanctification, sanctifying work. Look, you may be caught in some stuff right now that is the stuff that you don't want known about. And if so, boy, you better be worshiping. You better be coming to the Lord because he's going to have to change who you are. But he will change who you are. He will, he will, he will move you from where you were to, toward where you will be. And you will see that progress. And when you move through this stage of life called sanctification, don't ever let the past have a control over you. That is why Paul said in Romans 8, That the power of the spirit of life in Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death. All of the weight and all of the baggage. There is therefore, that verse starts out, 8-1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Period. It's over. And I'm going to walk in that fullness, grace upon grace upon grace. And last point for home, I'm going to see Jesus because I want to see God. No man can behold his face and live. Moses got to see the backside hiding, hidden in the cleft on the rock. That's okay. I want to behold Jesus because when I see Jesus, I see God the Father. No one's ever seen God, the only God who's at the Father's side, Jesus. He has made him known and that's how we'll know him. So I want to bless you in the name of Jesus. I'm sorry I've got to run out right after I teach today because we've got to, got to get to Florida and it's a long walk. <laughs> but I do want to bless you before I go. Father, in the name of Jesus, stir in our hearts a deep conviction of your overwhelming love for us that with your power and might has given us a grace, a mercy, a forgiveness that frees us up to be your people proclaiming your message today. In Jesus we pray and amen.